All right. There it is. All right. Well, thank you everyone for joining us today um, for an artist talk with Katie Ryder. Um, before we get started, I, I would like to introduce myself. My name is Margaret Stern, and I'm the communications and outreach manager for the Sioux Sitna River Coalition. And before um, we talk with Katie, I would like to thank all of our generous donors and sponsors that make events like this possible. So I would like to thank the Talkeetna Community Council and the Chase Community Council, as well as our really generous individual donors. So thank you so much, everyone. So tonight we're going to be welcoming Katie Ryder, um, who is a bush pilot, journalist, and artist. Um, she's a total inspiration. Um, I've always admired seeing Katie down at the Village Airstrip, seeing her take off and land, and always chatting with her about her adventures and seeing her work. Um, and she just has a really unique story about how she got involved with aviation and photography and painting and just all of the ways that she integrates these pieces of her life. Um, so I would love to pass this off to Katie Ryder and she will uh, tell us a little bit about her work and share some of her pieces. So thank you, Katie, for being here today. Thank you, Margaret. And it's really neat. Margaret's also a pilot. So it's really fun to have another female pilot. And uh, for those that know the Super Cub, we're both Super Cub drivers. They're um, they're two seaters, so they sit tandem, you know, one in the front is the pilot fine and the one in the back. So it, it really makes for a wonderful aircraft for doing photography. Um, I think it's really neat to start this. Since the power outage in Talkeetna, I had to kind of leave all my props at home. And I think it's pretty neat that we have Don Sheldon here <laughs> is, um, you know, one of the legendary bush pilots in this area and starting the flying up into the Alaska range. So um, and there's rage and energy behind me as well. It's really exciting to um, to be able to present this here at the Latitude. In the meantime, most of Talkeetna's um, here, you know, having a cold one on a Wednesday night. It's been about nine degrees during the day and nine below at night. So we're really getting into winter. I, I live um, in the Talkeetna River subdivision and um, my family and I, we do a lot of watching the river form up. This was kind of what it looked like last week. These rivers are constantly in a change in state. And um, it's a really a, a, an honor to be able to fly right out of the airstrip in downtown Talkeetna and get um, an, eye, an aerial view of all this. I study it a lot from the ground level as well. And um, I get a lot of my ideas from just the shapes of the river. The river has a lot of different moods and these are just a couple of samples of how many different shapes you see like diamond in the Talkeetna River in the uh, fall time. You can see kind of the silty colors and a lot of these kind of get me started off with doing some sketches. And so I might do like a sketch like this on just, you know, watercolor paper. And then I might, you know, turn it into something bigger like this. And uh, I really like usable colors. Uh, laying the paint on thick. This was kind of a <laughs> um, you're kind of inspired by often combining uh, my ideas of the glaciers, you know, that flow off of the Alaska Range and the Talkeetna Mountains. And then as they flow down the river, they take on a lot of different shapes of form, um, joining in on the Susitna River. So the Susitna River Coalition is an amazing group of people. I'm, I'm so honored to get to speak here tonight. And they uh, have a real passion for preserving what is important to us. I think of all of the um, future of our um, fisheries and our watershed being so important and the, the awareness that they bring to it is really inspiring. So I brought this one in. This one's called um, Future Fish and um, uh, Becca Matiason, who is the former art teacher at the Talkeetna Elementary, she bought the original of this one. And uh, Dave Totten and his wife Barb Totten um, were really helpful in mentoring me and making prints of my work. So it all kind of started really um, for me as an artist is kind of more of a hobby. And I just, I just create because I love to create and it's, um, I don't have a television and I find that it's a, it's a way for me to meditate and relax. So um, with that said, I wrote up a little bit to stay focused on what brought me to becoming a pilot. So I'm gonna go ahead and read this. 
Um, flying was never a childhood fantasy or even a possible dream of mine until I turned 30. But I do have many memories of looking into the cockpit of jetliners and smiling at the pilots, both male and female, admiring their ability to scoop us all up, take us across the landscape for hundreds of miles, and even deliver us safely to loved ones across oceans. The jet fuel got us there, but they were the pilots of those big planes. My first flight on a small aircraft was with my Uncle Fred, um, who lived in Florida. I was stunned by the closer to the ground flight. Fast forward to college, a geography field research trip to the Arctic Circle in a twin otter on floats. The pilot was a female and she landed this huge bush plane on the headwaters of the Hood River. There was no room for air, meaning there were rocks and very little space to land and stop before the banks narrowed. And we had to unload the plane rapidly so she could take off and get back to her home base as weather was rolling in. After she took off, the stimulation of being there in the Arctic Circle was a realization of the access to wilderness these little planes provided. Wow. Uh, fast forward again, Muncho Lake, British Columbia. A Swiss man named Urs flew us 120 miles into the Northern Canadian Rockies and almost got the Cessna 185 stuck in deep snow each time he dropped off our groups of three in gear. His clothes and fur hat looked like a fortress to the 20 below zero temperatures. His deliberate get out of the plane and get out of the way attitude also caught my attention. Like the twin otter pilot, these mission oriented enablers of our adventures seem superhuman. So then fast forward to 1999. Um, will the group of Kalanika, Ryder and Robin report to the ramp? Your flight is ready to depart. Um, another time in front of the instrument panel of a Cessna 185 with Talkeena Air Taxi skilled pilot, Paul Roderick at the controls. He made it all look so easy. Landing on a glacier and getting the plane turned around and ready to take off is not a simple task. But this trip in, the message came through to me that becoming a pilot is doable. Definitely in reach. Wow, how my life changed. <laughs> um, let's see here. These uh, series of introductions were linked by adventures and little did I know that I could too become a pilot and get myself into the wilds on my own. What I did not know is how hard it would seem to keep the dream alive in some ways, but also very much fluid series of, of events, one after another. In four years, I had all my ratings from private pilot to instrument rated, to commercial seaplane to a flight instructor. These ratings were similar to jumping through hoops, walking a tightrope like a trapeze artist at the Barnum Circus. There were falls, and, there were falls and gaps and money shortages and big debts, but eventually it all came together and I was ready to move to Alaska. So let's see, um, um, in 2004, Alaska became home and Talkeena was my starting point for many things, including raising a family. My husband was a hunting and fishing guide and he introduced me to sim living simply in the woods. We introduced each other to parenting. It happened in my late thirties. I'd say that my child rearing years give credit to becoming an artist. As I created an at-home niche that gave me rewards and identity on top of being a stay-at-home mom except I really wasn't fully a stay-at-home mom. I had an airplane. <laughs> and what a privilege that it was that I would never take for granted. A super cub on bush wheels, floats, and skis. Wow, dreamy. Um, this plane enabled me so many wonderful gifts of flight and perspective that I could no way keep those gifts to myself. So I started painting after flights and creating ways to hold on to the imagery and feeling of being elated. Life on the ground can be tedious and hard, it can lead to being boxed in and weighted to the ground like an anvil. Mostly, however, my life was amazing. We lived next to a beautiful river and waterfowl skimmed over our house en route to Papa Bear and Mama Bear Lakes. Our neighbors, dog yard howls and wind in the birch treetops added a feeling of belonging to the land. Yet the flights, the soaring over the three rivers, the Susitna, the Takitna and the Chilitna is what gave me so much inspiration and glee. And one day I thought I need to I may need a lot of reminders of that feeling of flight. I too wanted to remind others to be free like the bird, to see the lay of the land, and to look for beaver, bear, swan, and moose. I wanted to skim over the mountain passes and see caribou resting on snow. I wanted to remember all of these flights beyond the scribbles in my logbooks, many of which were accompanied by my children, Ren and Jasper. If I had not been gifted to becoming a mom, I may have continued on with those higher 
more advanced ratings. I may have really learned to fly in the clouds on those instruments that intimidated me long ago. I may have worn a button down shirt <laughs> on the shoulders. I may have been a, a scouter for animals like wolves and caribou herds in the Arctic Circle, but those never came to be, at least not for now, as I became an artist and photographer. I create beauty out of paintings from nature-inspired flights. I crowd our home. <laughs> um, let's see. Um, yeah, let's see where to go. Uh, with countless piles of canvas. <clears throat> Some of them are even finished. <laughs> Some I've sold to loved ones and art lovers showing me that they believe in me. I'm an artist pilot and a storyteller of the changing earth below. I am a mother, a wife, a dog, walker, a thinker, a solitary to a fall at times, but who is not in a pandemic? What defines me in this world beyond being all these things is that I get to fly. It's a privilege indeed that I'm devoted to sharing with you. This relationship to earth, air, and art in my family gives my life meaning and purpose. So, um, yeah, for the next few minutes, I'd like to share with you some of the images, these flights, and why I think they are important. Imagery of the area, the Susitna River Valley watershed is greatly important. And as this land becomes more desirable and purchased up and divided, it must be viewed as an interconnected whole. It is a watershed. Maps do define watershed, though photographs, they give definitions to time and space in an indisputable manner. We need records. We need to know how this landscape is changing and how human developments are changing the land. The weather events, the seasons, the pulse of the land seen by the pilot is valuable. The landscape seems timeless, yet it is also fragile and needs to have humans in big shoes of politics make wise decisions on how it is used. Humans think that they have ownership of the land, yet the animals and water bogs, bugs and swamps, these rivers are wild and they deserve respect and protection. That is why we all can and must continue to be aware and work together with teams of biologists, policymakers, activists, scientists, and environmentally conscientious land dwellers. And by being a sky dweller, it is my role to share my observations with you. So thanks for listening to that. That seemed really long. <laughs> no, that was awesome. I love the story. It's, it's good. It was beautiful. Yeah, thank you. So I, uh, I, I often, you know, go out and I, I get pictures like, like this and I get to see this shimmering light and uh, it's just, it's always so beautiful. And I think that um, one of the things that uh, is a real privilege is that I, I'm often, um, you know, I never really flew loads of passengers of, of people. I've always flown in a cub with just a small number of people. So I get to have that intimate, um, connection with myself and one other passenger to explore the, the land. And it really makes those flights really memorable and special for others. So um, I think that um, this time of year is a challenging time of year for many of us and, and because it's November and it's cold and there's a lot of um, just reasons why we you know, might be indoors more often because we are you know, dealing with like snow hasn't fallen for skiing yet, and there's um, a lot more time for creativity. So I think that it's a, a privilege to be able to inspire other people to find their inner artist and encourage them to um, just pick up the pencil or paintbrush and, and also create art because it's really, I think if I could do it, anybody could. And my, um, my background is really not in any formal training of art. I have a BA in geography and I'm a journalist. Uh, my journalism has um, led to a lot of opportunities in reporting about the environment. And I thought it might be a good time to show that little film that we had on the share screen. Should we do that, Margaret? Okay. That's great. Yeah. <laughs> you can hear uh, it's piping up here in the latitude. You can hear Philip Manning in the background there. <laughs> Teenage reporter. <laughs> totally, there's a party going on. That's great. Yeah. Okay, so if I go share screen, it says it's disabled. Oh, here, let me. Sorry, everybody, give me just a second. Let me make co host. And if anybody has any questions too, I, I wanted to mention I, uh, I've uploaded a lot of my um, art and photography to a website. It's called katierridergallery.com. 
and maybe Margaret could write that in the chat. And if anyone wanted to reach me, if you had any questions or anything, you can join my newsletter. And if you click to that um, katywritergallery.com, there's a little window that pops up and you can put your email in there. And I would love to stay in touch with you. And if you have any request of what you'd like to see as well. Yes, I'll be dropping uh, Katie's website down in the chat, as well as all the places you can find her work so you can find and support and check it out. Great. Okay, so let's see. Um, advanced video. Um, Alrighty. Um, let's see. So I think one of the greatest things about your artist statement too was how relatable parts of it were, but also how like not many people can relate necessarily to flying an airplane unless they're in Alaska, but then you have all these really personal pieces that are just so so relatable. Thank you for that. Okay, oh good. Here's this one. Oh, and then do I need to share that then? Let's see. We can see it. There. If I play that, is this gonna work? So that, um, there we go. That brings us back here. There we go. So that, that's landing at the village airstrip. And uh, it's, it's a kind of a unique um, airstrip. I really am appreciative of people like Robert Gerlach and Billy Fitzgerald. And, uh, you know, Rob Holt was one of the former people operating out of the village airstrip. And, uh, you know, Don Sheldon was also... <laughs> You know, that was where he operated. And it's just a, a very special place to park an airplane. It's kind of nostalgic to fly in over the Fairview and land. And when you take off, you take off right over the Susitna River and it, it gets real really quick. So um, it's smaller than um, a lot of places for airplanes. So it, it's really a nice place to keep the Super Cub. And I'm really grateful for Billy Fitzgerald, who is a dear friend and someone who um, has been just a real um, influence on my life here in Talkeetna too. So it's, I really have a lot of um, hard time hearing myself being called a bush pilot because I think of like these guys are the bush pilots. And even though, you know, I've been doing it for 20 years, I'm still kind of consider myself more of a pilot, <laughs> but uh, you know, it's just, um, it's just such a rich in aviation here in Talkeetna. There's so many wonderful um, pilots at the state airport and air taxis that do amazing things. And they enable a lot of lifestyle for people to get, uh, you know, things flown out to their remote camps. They enable people to go up into the Alaska range for climbing trips. And, uh, you know, more and more, you know, more people are getting to, you know, I guess do sightseeing tours in addition to, you know, the mission of being dropped off out in the wilderness. So, but um, anyhow, I, um, I was wondering if anybody had any questions. So one question um, is, so you, you, um, what came first? Did flying come first or did the art come first? Did they exist separately before and then merge? Or, or what was that? Yeah. Well, you know, really, um, so uh, when I was in, I got a, I went to the University of Colorado um, and I got a BA in geography there. And my last six credits of um, college credit were a field research course in the Arctic Circle. And there we had to uh, learn how to do field research. And, and Margaret is a 
biologist and works for fish and game, so you would appreciate this story. But I, uh, I found that what I was really, um, you know, just more philosophical than really good at the science part of it. So I've always been really philosophical and a kind of a deep thinker about nature and, and humans' relationship with nature. So a lot of my sketches were kind of more in relation to that. And um, so, you know, I really think that I had always been artistically minded, but really the, the flying um, kind of came second. And, and it was just so strikingly beautiful to be here in Alaska where there's no road systems. It's just all nature and you really see the topography and you see the amazing you know, glaciers coming out of the Alaska range and, and you know, how much that shapes the landscape here in the Susitna Valley where the Susitna River watershed is. And you know, being able to get that vantage point in an airplane and, and get that, you know, sometimes you can climb up to 4,000 feet and get that really big perspective. And then sometimes you can be like, or you know, 4,000 feet up or 400 feet. And you get all these different scales of seeing the landscape and all the patterns and so forth. So I think if that answers your question. I think the um, art came after kind of before flying and the flying kind of inspired more art. That's an interesting way they prop, they feed off of each other, which is really cool. I, I don't think many artists probably have that connection to these two different spaces. Um, so. Niraj asks, what keeps you yeah. inspired? So I did create a little um, video. Oh, is there another question? Oh, yeah, there was one more question of what keeps you inspired every day? <laughs> well, you know, we all need inspiration. <laughs> and I often, I put a, a lot of, um, you know, deadlines on myself. I think maybe sometimes I could be a little more free flowing. I'm always working on a project. I think that comes from, um, you know, my, my up, bringing my, my father was a real um, inspiration still is in the sense that he was always on a community project, always kind of working on something. Um, and I think that I have that genetic trait that I, I just feel like, you know, I don't know, I feel like I need to be doing something important. <laughs> and so, you know, whether it's creating a podcast, you know, talking to scientists about what they see in climate change or, trying to create a story. I don't know. I just, I think I get my inspiration from just an inner clock that just needs to be um, doing something. And I will say that I don't have a television. And so there, there's like not that distraction. And I have two wonderful kids, Ren and Jasper, that keep me really busy. And, um, you know, they are getting more into their teen years. So it's even, you know, more independent from them to stay busy with creating stuff. So. Um, they get to see, you know, the challenge of moms, you know, art studio has basically always been in the house. And I think, you know, Caitlin can relate to this in Alaska, we don't have a lot of space. And, you know, often to create, you just having to <laughs> just do it right, right there in the household. And it's frustrating at times because, you know, sometimes you got to like clean everything up really quick to have dinner at the dinner table or whatnot. But um, it's, it's, I think um, it's worn off on them. I think they're both really creative as well. Great, we have one more question. Do you wanna save it for now or, or save it for later? Or go ahead and go for that. Yeah, we can do, Great. we might as well answer it now. All right, sounds good. Um, Caitlin asked, do you have one time of year that you really like to fly the most? That is the most inspiring for your artwork. You know, I think that fall time is really hard to beat. It's just the colors are, are so amazing when you get the, you know, here's, um, it just, it's just such a neat place because the rivers are changing color so much and they, they really do just, and you get these amazing, amazing colors. Um, since we had the power outage, I wasn't able to bring a lot of my props in. So uh, maybe now would be a good time. I have Another one that we can bring in that other way from just my desktop. And it doesn't really matter that there's not sound in, but I would like to take you for a flight of something I created yesterday. Okay, so. Um, basic, advanced. Um, um, let's see, well. 
Well, this one, I wonder if this is gonna be the right one. All right, this one, okay, this one, um, this one is kind of shows you a little bit of my serious side and we'll start with this and see how this goes. This is kind of being a journalist and a lot of what I wanted to mention in this talk was the importance of, I think, having a message to share. Here we go.
so that that was something that I made in 2019, and uh, it was um, pretty serious in tone. I, I really haven't circulated that video. That came at a time in my life that I was writing a story about climate change for AOPA Pilot Magazine. And uh, this was a big uh, deal for me. It was an important topic. I feel like a lot of what we're seeing here in Alaska with the melting glaciers and what comes into the Susitna River is, is, is really intense at times. That year of 2019 was particularly standout with all the wildfires. And um, after a year of that, I was pretty uh, much needing a, a little break. <laughs> so I, I think that's what's helped me to realize that, well, you know, I think journalists that that are really passionate about their topic sometimes do need a break and this is where I jumped to art and photography and it really kind of switched gears and I, I, I really um, enjoyed creating my website with the beauty of um, the area uploading pictures of the landscape and and just kind of um, celebrating our natural world I think that the time that we're in right now is um, um, Wonderful. I think there's wonderful technology out there. I think that the COP26 uh, conference on the climate change held recently was really encouraging. And there's a lot of incredibly smart um, scientists and people and policies that could, you know, really switch what's going on here. And so I feel like, you know, I have a lot of hope with what, what can switch with that as far as the warming trends of our planet. Um, on, on a party note, you know, I think that um, creating art for me and having some of my paintings is upbeat. <laughs> and even in the naming of my paintings, um, names like Moby Otter, Happy Fish, Future Fish, Cosmic Dance, Fresh Cut Flowers, and Northern Lights are a few of the paintings that decorate with friends and family. Um, my prints are also spreading around the message to just create and um, just create art and and allow yourself to celebrate the beauty of the natural world. Thank you so much for sharing. Katie. Thank you so much for sharing. Oh, one second, I think I'm. Um, so a few more questions from Facebook came in, um, especially after showing that video, uh, which thank you so much for sharing. I, I don't think everybody, anybody has ever shared multimedia experiences in one of our talks. So that was really special um, and, and really touching to see just all, everything put in one place from what happened in that summer. Um, and so do you feel a sense of urgency um, within your artwork as well um, in terms of communicating climate change? Do you feel like you communicate climate change through your work or is that more focused on the beauty aspect? Well, you know, I have a whole, um, I have a whole bunch of photography on glaciers and I really would love to see um, my artwork picked up in bigger um, venues. I've been, um, you know, I, I do, I have, um, I, think, I think art and the sale of art, one of my projects that I'm working on right now, as a matter of fact, is um, kind of setting up a link you know, maybe some of the environmental conservation groups and some of the proceeds from the sales that I got on my website would go to some of those conservation groups. And I think that, um, I think that a lot of it is spreading awareness. And if you go to my website, katywritergallery.com, you can go to About the Artist and you can see the actual link to the story that I wrote on the glaciers and how much change we are seeing in those glaciers. I interviewed a lot of local pilots, including, um, you know, uh, Paul Roderick, Paul Claus, you know, they, those two have different philosophies on climate change. I think it's good to have the broad spectrum of that. And I also interviewed the scientist, Brian Brettschneider, as well as um, Rick Toman. And these are leaders in, you know, science and, and research. And I think that um, the more awareness that gets spread to um, the general population, the more people will pay attention and be interested in getting in, involved, you know, with whether it's Boeing or the leaders that they choose. So that's something I did want to share. Great, thank you. Um, another question was, which is your favorite river out of Tapitna? <laughs> <laughs> you know, they're all three so interlinked and I, I, I yeah, just love the Talkeetna River. I think that's just right out our back door. Um, it takes me up into the Talkeetna Mountains. And I think I, I really do have um, a draw to that. I'm not so 
much traveling up into the Alaska range. It's uh, more gas money, <laughs> more burning fuel. So I find that the short, you know, flights into the Talkeetna Mountains, going up the Talkeetna River and then coming back down is my favorite. Awesome. Cool. So flying clearly gives you a broader perspective from the air. How has that, um, has that changed your perspective on climate change? What, what have you kind of seen through that in terms of year to year changes from? Well, the, the, the spruce beetle kill is one of the most noticeable ones that you too, Margaret, probably have noticed when you come back from your place in Big River um, of how, you know, each year it's, it's been moving further north. <laughs> And so that is a big one. The fire scars are really noticeable in the summertime. Um, and the, uh, the glaciers, when I, I have a route that I do, I like to go check out the toe of the roof glacier every year at different times of year. And I photograph that. And I'm just shocked on how much it is receding and how much it's like, you know, on a summer day, it's, um, you know, just the melt is, melt off is tremendous um, at certain times. Um, you know, I think that uh, I guess a lot of it is the earth is always changing and a lot of people would argue that it's always in a state of flux and change. And so, you know, I, I kind of am aware of that aspect of it too. And I just get out and enjoy what I see from day to day. Yeah, cool. Um, so you are a journalist and you paint with oils and you do photography. Is there any, do you, do you see the photography as a piece of documentation um, and documentary work? Or do you see that as a creative pursuit or is there, is there a difference sometimes in those goals of your pictures and your photography? Yeah, no, I, I really see it as documentary. And, and I think that is kind of a life dream of mine to be a documented filmmaker. <laughs> And so um, I'm amazed what, what one can do with a cell phone, you know? <laughs> this right here is an amazing tool and I can do so much with this in regards to flying safely. And, you know, people wonder, well, how do you get these pictures um, and fly? Well, um, it's, it's a lot of this technology is so good and I can have, you know, one hand on the stick, you know, I kind of fly with my legs sometimes and I <laughs> use this as the camera and, you know, it's, <laughs> amazing um and i know that it helps me to shape my vision and i know in the long run maybe i could work with filmmakers and and you know those that might have a uh, uh, more connections with making that message known like getting sponsors and and continuing on that project is is a dream of mine cool um so when did you start oil painting and how did you get started with that well, that's a fun story. I'd love to tie in some of the local artists. So Tony Crescetto held an oil painting class here in Talkeetna, and it was right across from the ranger station. And, you know, it was just um, so much fun. There was about five of us in that class and we painted a little cabin. And um, the oils I realized were really tricky compared to the watercolor. I don't know, it's just a different you know, flow going and so forth. And um, so that was kind of, um, being inspired by Tony Crescetto, some of the other local artists that are oil painters are really amazing is um, Bill Barstow and, uh, you know, Steve Durr and the whole Durr family. I mean, all of those amazing artists in this community are um, some that I've watched their work in the Dancing Leaf Gallery. And, you know, I love the local art shows at the Flying Squirrel Bakery Cafe. I love seeing every, everybody else's stuff. And um, I've been honored that Anita of the Pine Squirrel Bakery has been such a great avenue for artists to show their work. Yeah, they, they always have a fun. So that was kind of a start. To, to be able to put my work up was kind of a uh, humbling move because really I'm just a work in progress. And I think that makes me unique that I don't really um, worry too much about what others think because I know a lot of my everything in my life is a process. And I think it's important to just start and just do it. And then I think that's how, you know, if you find the passion there, just to keep going is really great. Cool. You've mentioned before that um, you've gotten your kids involved in your work as well and taken them up flying. And how has that changed over the years? Um, do they still, do, do they have a greater appreciation, do you think, for this area? Because they get to 
you know, see it from the sky and see things changing and get, get to really witness the day to day. Yeah. I find that my, my daughter, Ren is especially keen on going flying just the other day. She's like, God, we haven't been out in a while. We should go flying. And, and she has a, um, a category on my website. It's Ren's photos and, and so does Jasper. And um, when she makes a sale, she could make sometimes like a hundred bucks. So she's thinking about the holidays and she likes to shop. So she's like, maybe we need to get some fresh photos on the website. So that's really great. And I know that um, those kids are usually pretty game on going. There's some phases that they're, you know, teenagers now, they're more um, interested in hanging out with their friends, but um, we do some neat things. My son and I had a really special um, float trip to Trapper Lake and caught a giant um, pike, a northern pike that was so, I mean, it was, it was so big. I'm not kidding. <laughs> and it, it, it had a pike this big in its belly and we did that um, together. That will always be an incredible memory. And, um, you know, we do also just, I've been, they've been in there with me for the whole duration. So I, I, I'm really lucky to have had that connection and that, that mother, um, son, mother, daughter bond through flying. That's so cool. Let's see. Um, I have some more questions here. Um, well, what, what is your favorite subject? And you also, I have two questions in this. So what, what's your favorite uh, thing to paint? Um, and then beyond that, you seem to have two different styles. Some of your work is pretty impressionistic um, and others are more realistic. And I'm curious how you kind of toggle back and forth between that. Well, well, in all honesty, it's a process of experimentation. And when I start uh, a canvas, you know, I will often go off of a photograph. And um, this is an example of, of that. I'll show you. Um, oh, so just the other day, I wanted to just start something for this presentation. And I, I thought this is a really cool image. It shows how low the river is on the, this is the Susitna River. Um, maybe in like late or early fall. And, you know, the river boats start having a little more trouble making it down. The channels are not as deep and so forth. So I use this as an outline. And then um, since it's the dark time of year, I thought I'm gonna bring out some colors that are bright and cheery. So if you can see that, you know is sort of the shape of this, so put them together. Um, that helped me to, to kind of outline that. And this really gives you a feeling of the flow of all those channels. And uh, so this is kind of a work in progress. And when you can actually go like this. <laughs> yeah, there we go. That makes more sense. And, and so, you know, the thing with oils is it requires a lot of coats and you can't be too attached to that first coat. And so that's really different than a watercolor. And it makes it where, you know, if you don't like it, then you just add on another thick coat. But some of my, you know, images are simple. Um, it's hard to tell the definition of this one, but just the, the landscape of the, this kind of reminds me of being up, you know, more sky the land, you know, even though it's green, I play with the colors, even though this is the sky, this is the land. Um, I, I do a lot of play with color. Just to, I think we all need a lot of color and brightness in our homes. And so that inspires me to do that. Um, I did want to show you my impressionism you brought up. And this is another example of um, how the landscape sneaks into my my paintings, the, there's a lot of meandering oxbow rivers in Alaska, and uh, this is kind of the raven here. So sometimes I just let it flow, and, and I think there's a lot of magic and lore in this country around here. There's a lot of uh, mythology that just kind of inspires me, where I don't even know what I'm going to do when I start with a blank canvas, and sometimes things just come out, and this raven is an example of that. And this one is called Waiting Raven. <laughs> so 
So that's a little bit of my impressionism. So speaking of oils, um, is that really hard to work with something like that, that you can always go back? I've never painted with oils, so maybe you can't always go back and change it, but is it hard to stop? <laughs> Yeah, hard to know when to stop for sure, you know, and um, and it, it is you have to let it dry and that sometimes causes a lot of delay of finishing a painting. I sometimes have had a painting where I started it and then I didn't finish it until four years later. <laughs> yeah, because it, it's just, you, you know, sometimes you, you're feeling it and then you look at it and you don't know what to do with it. And then, you know, a lot of it is at the request of um, maybe I'll have a deadline with an art show or something like that, and I need to fill some walls, and so then I'll pull out some, and I'll just finish them, you know, in a week. So, yeah. Yeah. So, so you're talking about having deadlines sometimes. Is it and it's and it being nice to have a deadline. Um, so, what is it like creating under deadlines? Is it harder, do you think, or is it? you know, harder to pull something out then? Yeah, I really need deadlines sometimes to finish things. And, and I definitely motivated by a deadline. And I think that's why I often um, seek out an art show because I think I, I have to finish these canvases. So I think having um, deadlines are really helpful because it, it is hard. I'm, I'm sure that um, William, you know, Bill Barstow and Tony Crescetto would agree on you know, when they have a show coming up that, that it's like, it helps you just a lot that time for creating. So when you're flying and going up into the air, um, are you going up some days specifically to take pictures or, or are there some days where you just say, I'm going for a flight or going to a destination and I'm gonna leave the photography equipment or, or and your phone away? Yeah, you know, um, my, my phone is kind of always in my pocket. So, um, but oftentimes, uh, you know, I, I've had a lot of um, missions with the, with the airplane. And when I, I did a lot more um, support for uh, Billy Fitzgerald with the, uh, his company, kind of maybe when the kids were little, where the flights were just, you know, direct back and forth, you know, you empty out everything out of the cub and you take a load of, you know, meat peckers for hunting or um, camps, you know, or guides. And I would do, you know, flights back and forth to the Tucky, the mountains. And so those flights um, were, were all about how fast can you get there, point A, B. And what I find that um, when I do go for the flights just for inspiration or just to take a little time to myself, those flights are a lot like, uh, they're just really, um, I, I don't know, it might be a good time to incorporate that I, also a, um, a life skier and when I um, you know I've spent you know a lot of time on my ski in the backcountry and uh, route finding and, and doing a lot of that kind of skiing and and so in a way when I go flying sometimes with someone in the back seat it feels like I'm taking someone on an extreme ski run you know and I get to and you know go right over the ridge and yeah I'm thinking and you know I did that with my son here this fall and, and it was just so special um are you more likely to be on floats or skis or wheels when you go out and take photos you know i think really um more of the wheels for photos you know the skis um sometimes it's cold and so probably the wheels yeah yeah <laughs> awesome um, does anybody else have any more questions for Katie before we kind of begin wrapping up? We'll probably go about five minutes over since we um, started a little bit late because of all the power issues in Talkeetna, but we'd love to get all your questions answered. So feel free to keep on typing them in the chat, both on Facebook and here on Zoom. Yeah, and I just, um, a reminder, you can go to my website at katieridergallery.com and if anyone, um, wants to you know i'd give you a you know you could even just say friend 20 um in the checkout and there'd be 20 percent off on anything from tonight's show and i would love to um donate some of my proceeds if anyone wanted to buy any artwork tonight i would love to donate some of the proceeds to the susitna river coalition thank you that's so generous katie i really appreciate yeah. that um is there anything else that you really would like to add regarding your work tonight 
you know, I think we really covered it. It's a, it's a real honor to be able to speak here with you all. And, um, you know, if you want to join my newsletter, I encourage you to go to my website and join and sign up. I would love to learn more about the audience. I love hearing everyone's stories and what brought them to, you know, also be interested in the Susitna River Coalition. So. Awesome. Thanks. And I, I have to say, I, I just love yeah. hearing your artist statement in the beginning and the just how you've kind of taken us through all these different pieces of your process. That's been really fun tonight. And I do think it's kind of fitting that you're in the latitude with the, in the pilot corner. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Right, just very Con Sheldon. Is that so cool? Yeah, it is super cool. Well, again, if everybody wants to go to Katie Ryder Gallery, um, she has some great work up there. You can find her on Instagram at AKKTWriter. I've dropped that in the chat as well. Katie puts up some really amazing videos of the Susitna quite a bit um, and a lot of great pictures of her um, shots of the Susitna flying um, and just, just a lot of really fun content that is just fun to see and always an inspiration and just really fun to check up and see what the Susitna is doing at on on any given day when Katie's sharing it. It's I love checking it out. Um, and you can find her at the Dancing Leaf Gallery downtown as well as at Sioux Sitna Valley, Valley Naturals downtown um, and her website. And she also has um, a podcast that you can check out all cooped up Alaska. Katie's just doing all sorts of things and it's fun to watch. So thank you so much, Katie. And uh, I really gosh. appreciate you being here today and making it work. Thank you so much, Margaret. It's been really fun working with you as well. And, and thanks everybody for tuning in. I really appreciate you listening. And everyone have a wonderful rest of your week. Have a great night, everyone. Happy Thanksgiving. Everyone have a good Thanksgiving holiday. Oh, right. <laughs> and hopefully the power goes back on for everyone. Oh. <laughs> Oh, right on. What a way to have a generator for backup. Margaret. Oh my gosh, I was amazed that it worked. I had to warm it up in the car to get it going. Oh my God. Anyways, kind of, kind of silly. All right. Thank you so much, Katie. I'll talk to you later. I appreciate it. Okay. Thank you, Margaret. Thanks, everybody. Have a great day. Bye. Thanks so much.